average sale price of a Manhattan apartment is up 18% to slightly above $2 million. The average median price is up 15% from the same period last year. The average days on an apartment is on the market is down by 7%. The average price per square foot is up astounding 35%. For the luxury market, the average sale price is up 14%. The average price per square foot is up 9%. The number of sales are up 8.5%. So all the numbers are going up. But yet, when you read the headlines and you talk to the people on the market, you see a lot of hesitation. You hear people talking about market adjustments. What do you think is setting off the alarm for a lot of people? Arthur, I'd like to start with you. Does this work? Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at 2000, I mean, and 9-11, and you look at 2008, the financial crisis, there's a real macro issue that affected the market. This time, the market is strong. It just has to do with certain articles coming out. But there's a lot of buyers out there. And we see, can, we see the first quarter of this year to be very, very strong. So I see no reason why the market should be slow. Right, and over, and year over year, I think the numbers have been great. I mean, yeah. Yeah. already for this first quarter of 2016, we've seen great numbers. But still, you feel there is this weight on the market. And, uh, you know, and how, do you, how do you get around that? Well, the, the weight of 9-11, the weight of 2008 financial, compared to what we have now, is nothing. There's no reason for this market to be slow. And there's still a lot, a lot of buyers. So I think we're in for good times. Great. Michael, I think you wanted to chime in. No, I'm listening. I think, you know, you ask what's driving the kind of the fear in the market. And I think that what Arthur was trying to say, but he wanted to be politically correct with you, <laughs> is he wanted to say that it's the articles in the press that's really depressing the market. But I think it, it, it doesn't really matter what the reason is. I think it's more important to understand really what are kind of the fundamentals of, of why are people buying and not buying. And you know, the way that I look at it, it's very simple. There's three, three aspects. Cash, right? Is there money? Is there liquidity out there? I don't think anybody's going to disagree that there's no money in the market. What Arthur was saying in 08 or, or, or after September 11, there was obviously liquidity issues. There are no liquidity issues, OK? There's a mood issue. Right now, the main issue is there's a mood issue. In start first quarter of this year, there were issues with China. There were stock market volatility that really kind of depressed, in essence, de depressed the buyers. I was sitting and I'm going to give you kind of a two-second story. I was having lunch in March with a friend. He said, I feel poor. I said, what happened? I lost $350 million. I said, that's painful. The guy's worth $5 billion. Yeah. He said, so I'm not buying an apartment right now. Mind you, the market's been up then. Now he feels rich, and now he's buying an apartment. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, when you look at the luxury market, and I think that's what your panel is about, you really have to understand what, what the drivers are. And the last issue is supply and demand. And I think the only thing that today is, I don't think, is, I think there's a weight on the market, is because there's oversupply of overpriced average apartments. And those are buildings that should have not been built, mm -hmm. should have not been developed, and those are the pro that's the product that's going to suffer. Can you name a few? <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to let Billy do that. keep it confidential. Exactly. It's, it's, Billy, I'm going to hand that to you. No, but, I'm not going to um, give an editorial review of development product in the pipeline. I, I, I tend to agree to a certain extent with what, what Arthur and Michael are saying. And while there might be a temporary pause or a slowdown in velocity, I think the market has to be taken apart and bifurcated from super luxury product, luxury product, because everything is luxury product. But if you look at the city, what, what's really been amazing over the last 10 and 15 years has been the massive gentrification of New York in total. So that's not just the commercial markets and the residential markets, but it's really both together. So you see new neighborhoods, a secular shift to the west side, whether it's Hudson Yards, what's happening downtown. Some of our panelists here are building great buildings downtown. And, and that changes the fabric of New York. And as that has changed, so too has our reliance on unemployment base. We have seen steadily a diversification away from the fire sector to technology, to life sciences, and all of that bodes well for, for sort of an underlying and sustaining health of our economy. 
are all of those people buying $10,000 per square foot, $150 million apartments? No, but one could also make an argument that perhaps there shouldn't be a lot of those apartments available on the market, and we should settle into a more normalized three to $4,000 type of product. Um, oh, Bruce, go ahead. I hate you. So it falls to me <laughs> to be the guy who says what really is. So, um, unfortunately, the reason they write the articles is because of the facts. Um, fact number one, between 2007 and 2015, there were approximately 255 apartments sold for between 10 and 20 million dollars. That's fact. Fact number two, there are 200 apartments on the market between 10 and 20 million dollars today. Wow. So, that's why they write those articles. Now, if you talk about the market for apartments between one and three million dollars, the number of apartments on that, that are on the market are way less than the demand. So the problem basically that exists is essentially threefold. The first is there's an awful lot of expensive apartments that are on the market. The number of apartments sold in that previous period from 2007 to 2015 that were 30 million to 150 million dollars in nine years was 140 in the entire city of New York. There are 160 on the market. Hello. So the issue, the issue, and, and, and the author, I mean, there are buyers, but the, the perception of most buyers is that things are fully priced. So what happens when people think things are fully priced? A, they shop all over the place. B, they take much more time. C, they actually think that they want a discount. Shocking. So really what, what, and what you have as a consequence of that is, one, you tend to have a, a flight to quality. Two, there's this desire for negotiability. And three, very difficult in a new development to create a sense of urgency for something that you're talking about that's two plus years hence. And that reflects itself in a diminution in the number of sales. Is the market dead? Of course not. Uh, are we going to be pained? Definitely. All right, well, that was good. Um, I th that, Amir, I think just, just one item that, and I appreciate the facts, but I think that, that there's one issue with, with the facts that you mentioned about the number of apartments. Between 07 and now, which is in decade, the average price per square foot for those super expensive apartments has more than doubled. So I think that, that the categories that, that, that you're referring to, as much as, as, as I agree that there might be too much but, you know, of, of, of expensive apartments on the market, your $10 million apartment today was a $5 million apartment in 07. So I think that, that the numbers, even though drastic, they're not as drastic as, as I think uh, um, those numbers would, would actually show. Well, I, th I think that's, that's right. You have to consider some adjustment within that of, 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 of where dollars equate then to yesterday to today. But I think you also, over that period of time, to see how other international markets have opened up and what the complexion and demographic of buyer coming into this market is and how that has changed. Because that's also driven pricing, development, and product as well. There's no question. I, I was just referring to the starkness of the numbers and like everything, all numbers are a bit in the eye of the beholder. And they I, we all, well, I, I, I don't think these guys need me up here. Because, uh, right, go ahead. Yeah, right, I'll, I'll go. But, um, but yeah, you have very experienced developers like uh, Chitreet and Witkoff. Witkoff, last, just last Tuesday, he said that there's a distress in the market. And he, you know, he stopped his plans for the Park Lane. Chitreet, uh, you know, who is planning to build out the Sony building and do a $2 billion sellout, he recently, you know, 
pulled out of that deal and the people who are going in there, uh, the Olion Group, which is a Saudi company, they're going to keep it as a commercial uh, tower. So you feel like these very experienced developers who are like, maybe I should, you know, take my foot out of the game for a while. Yeah, I mean, I think both projects were affected by the financial markets. It's very difficult to get a construction loan, especially over a billion dollars. The banks are pulling back, they're exposed, they're limited to $50 million per loan. So if you want a billion dollar loan, you need 20 banks. Trying to get 20 people together is almost impossible. So I think the at t building was affected by an inability to get construction financing. The, the Sony building? The Sony building, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm old fashioned. <laughs> He's saving himself. It was built as the at t building by Johnson and Sony bought it. So the Sony building converted to back to office, easy exit for them. They probably pocketed you know, 100 million bucks is not bad. And they'll do something else. They'll do more commercial, they're commercial people. Whitcoff, I think, is expanding his site. So I'm not sure if he's slowing down or if he's trying to buy out tenants. Mm -hmm. So that's a big question mark there. But he has a great site. And once it's expanded, it will be very interesting. Right. Uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, so, some of the, some of this, uh, excitement about the market is a bit artificial because of the low interest rates. And I know you guys are all active in the market right now. And what percentage of your buyers are foreign buyers and cash buyers? It's traditionally 5% of the market are foreign buyers. Only 5%? Only 5%. Only 5%. Yeah. Okay. Well, the but the co-ops, condos, everything, townhouses. Mm -hmm. It's a very small percentage. The articles, is about, if you listen to them, it's like 90% of the buyers are foreigners. <laughs> But through Brown, Harris, and Halstead, we track it very carefully. Right. And Michael, for you and Bruce, are your buyers are foreigners and cash buyers? I mean, but it depends on the product. I mean, the, you know, the problem is, again, going back, and I agree with Bruce, the, the, the press has a tendency of reporting uh, about the market as a whole. I think we need to stop talking about the market like it's all going down, it's all going up, because that's not healthy. You know, I, and I think that's, that's where, where, where inherently, you know, we, we, this discussion is, is, is a bit problematic. There are product, if you're looking at the heart of the Upper East Side, that's probably 95% locals. Midtown is probably, in new development, is probably 65% foreigners. There are pockets, every neighborhood in New York, and even within that neighborhood, right, every building has its own character. The buyers at 157 are not the buyers at 432 Park, right? It's a different type of buyer and a different mix of buyer. So I think we need to be very, you know, very specific on, on when, when, when we talk about that. But just let's go back to your first question. So Shitrit bought the building for a billion one and sold for a billion four. That building should have never been a residential conversion. It's a great office building, and it should have always been an office building. And it doesn't really have a competitive advantage in this market to be a residential building. It's not on the park. It doesn't has a few units with park views. There is no reason for that. It, it didn't have a space within the residential market. He made a tremendous amount of money, all things considered. And I agree with Arthur. It's obviously also there's financing issues. But the guy walked away with, with a substantial amount of money. If you look at Steve's project at, at the Park Lane, and you know, I think that if you read the press, there were some partnership issues there. There's a partner there that had to be taken out. Right? Greenland just came in and, and took him out. So I think it'll be interesting to see what Steve's next move is, when he's going to kind of pick up, the, pick up that project. But do you still have developments that are in prime spaces on 57th, which is you know, billionaire's row. You don't get any better than that, uh, that are sort of delaying their sales. I and mean, what do you say about those guys? And they have you know, beautiful designs, and they're right, on, you know, they're right on 57th, and they're delaying their sales. I can't yeah. ask them. They're not here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They were on your panel a few months ago. You should have asked them then. I'm sorry? They were on your panel a few months ago, I think. It, that wasn't the issue back then. It's also important to note about the Sony building. At the time that Chatree bought it and, and removed it from the office stock of inventory, nobody decried that as the death of the office market. So why now, when the building returns to the office, should that be the clarion call to say the condo market's over? That, that, that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But, but I think, you know, underlying all of this is sort of an interesting question, which is where goeth development and why? And, you know, if you look in Brooklyn, God forbid someone would look in Brooklyn, um, 
which really one should look in, there's probably less than a thousand units for sale in Brooklyn. And none of those units that's on the market in Brooklyn is probably over $2,000 a square foot. Um, and I suspect that you'll see in 2016 and 17 between Williamsburg, Greenpoint, downtown Brooklyn, maybe even Gowanus. Um, I think you'll see development there, and I think you'll see for sale development there because it's a much more compelling set of numbers, and there's a huge demand for, relatively speaking, affordable, if there is such a word, condominiums. Um, and if somebody put a, a building on the market on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and that building were priced at, say, $2,400 or $2,500 a foot, it would sell. The, the issue, in part, is the proliferation of product which is priced north of $3,000 a foot, and how much of that product really never should have been $3,000 a foot, doesn't demand $3,000 a foot, and it probably isn't going to get $3,000 a foot. And so really, and, and, and Michael was talking about this, and Billy was an author as well, you really, the, the problem that you have is that the press talks about the luxury market. Well, you know, I don't think anybody's got a better piece of dirt than Billy does in the village. I mean, look how Rudin sold, basically, the only new development at a very brisk pace um, in this market. And if you've got great dirt in an A location and it's sensibly priced, you're going to do well. If you are in that midtown so-called billionaire's um, uh, market, you're going to compete with a lot of other people. And as Michael said, the preponderance of people that are bought there are probably foreigners. It's not a secondary residence. It's like a fifth residence. So it's hard to create some sense of urgency. So I think that you're going to see um, 2016 and 17 be a series of stories. Uh, this question is actually from Steve Kliegerman. Uh, who works for you, Arthur? Uh, land prices continue to skyrocket, you know, at, and there's been almost very little transaction of land in the city in the last uh, quarter and a half. At this point, if you own land, what do you do? Do you try to sell it or do, do you try to build it? And if you are going to build it, what would be your strategy and how would you devise that? Well, it gets back to Bruce. It depends on where the piece of dirt is. Let's say in Manhattan, below 80th Street. Depends if it's what did you pay? <laughs> Depends what do you pay, how big a building you can build, how good the product it is, how the views are, how tall you can build, how, you know, how is, is there commercial? So I, I think it's, it's a very complex question. What we've done, like on 60th Street, we bought that in 2000 and held it for 14 years through an assemblage process so we can hold land for a very long time. It depends how much cash you put down, how your financing is, and what your basis is. I mean, I would say if I was starting now, you know, our projects are basically complete and sold and financed. We have GMPs. I mean, we're done. If I was starting now, I would wait. I'd buy the piece of land for two, three-year hold, and then wait for the market to, you know, to absorb the product. We think there's $55 billion of Schedule A apartments on the market. Right. Half of those are downtown. Of the $55 billion, $12 billion is closed. I mean, 10 billion is sold, so you have 25 billion to sell. So you bought your land in 2000. And the Upper East Side you know, has almost no new construction, nor is the Upper West Side, mostly concentrated downtown, midtown, in those areas. And, but if you look at resales, the resales in the Upper East Side and, and the Upper West Side are the strongest. You know, and then comes downtown. So it just depends wh where you are. I mean, I would buy a piece of land today and hold it for two, three years, just put cash in and wait. That's what Milsteins have done and the Litwins. 
Uh, so you bought your land in 2000. For the sake of being competitive, are you willing to sort of lower your prices so that you could beat out everybody else in the market on 60th Street? Well, if you, when you buy a 2000, your land costs are like $75 a foot. Wow. So we, we're in there for 200 bucks a foot, so our costs are very low. And we've sold enough to be very, you know, we've sold a lot. So I would say we are very happy the way it's going. It's only on the 14th floor, we have, we're going 55 stories. So we have another 600 feet to go vertical. And, you know, it, the, the market in the midtown is, is taken off. Right. As well as downtown. Downtown's very strong. I think the entire market is doing well this last quarter. Uh, you guys all have active uh, projects in the market, and you're all in one way or another competing with each other for luxury buyers. Uh, Bruce, what sets your property apart from Michael's? First of all, you know, I think that the idea that properties compete with one another is sort of an interesting thesis because um, I find that when people are in the market, the first thing that they are interested in is what is the neighborhood? They buy neighborhoods. You try to move somebody from the Upper East Side to the Upper West Side. <laughs> try to move somebody from the Upper West Side anywhere. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, so the first thing that you're dealing with is what's the neighborhood? And, you know, I'm with a group of talented guys, but the one thing that none of us can do is we can't move our properties. So once you buy it, you own it. Um, the second thing that people really like in New York is views. So if you happen to be in a position to give a view or provide a view, that's something that's compelling. Um, the, the Flatiron District, you know, it, it's sort of the new center of the city because it's equidistant between uptown, um, downtown, and people like that. Um, fortunately, I've got a almost 800 foot tall building, so it's got views. But, but the fact of the matter is that the traffic is down 50%, but the people that are coming are all real. Um, the time that it takes you to sell something is longer than it was 12 months ago. But at the end of the day, there's a flight to quality, people are buying neighborhoods, and people are buying views. And we're fortunate enough to have all three, um, and I think that that's going to make a difference in the long run. Are the amenities really that different from building to building? I mean, does it matter if you use concierge redefined or luxury attache or you have a pool in your uh, building? It, I mean, are they really that different? Like, can they be a real big selling point? You, you know, we, we got into a very, very heated debate. Um, Gold, Goldman Sachs is my partner in the development of, of 12th Street, and the deal really almost blew up over the issue as to whether or not we should have a pet spa. That's no, legit. I, I'm That's actually, legit. I'm actually, That's I'm actually, legit I'm actually kidding about that. I think you know, amenities. Amenities have have a time and a place, but sometimes certain amenities, beyond concierge, gym, perhaps a tenant lounge, outdoor space, and some greenery, at a certain point, one has to think that an overabundance of ancillary or extraneous amenities tend to be put in place to perhaps ameliorate issues such as neighborhood, an off location other challenges selling, or something compelling to try and drive traffic to, to your building. So I think a lot, it gets back to what has been a consistent theme amongst the panelists here is it's by neighborhood, it's by deal, it's by location. Mm -hmm. And each development, I think, drives the amenities story differently. Michael, do you want to chime in on that? No, I think, you know, I, I appreciate what Bruce is saying. You know, everybody here will tell you, Bruce will tell you that the Flatiron is the new center of the city. <laughs> Billy will tell you that the village is the center of the city. And, and Arthur will tell you that, that that Midtown is the center of the city. Upper East Side. Upper East Side, okay. <laughs> Let's go up east side because we each have, we're each talking from billions of dollars of positions, okay? So first thing, don't believe everything everybody says here, okay? <laughs> I, but, 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 but there is, guys, there is a buyer 
Right, again, the buyer that's going to buy in, in, in Billy's project on 12th Street is not buying in Bruce's project on, in, in a flat iron because it's a totally different profile. And I think, again, I'm, I'm probably the only one that comes from, from I used to sit over there. And, 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 you know, I did that job for many years and I've done marketing for many years. And I think that I focused for, for probably 15 years on understanding what people want. And, and today when we develop, that's really the focus. And I think what you're hearing, again, what Billy was saying about amenities, you have to understand your buyer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and this, the, the, the notion of just build it and they will come, it has flown out the window 15, 20 years ago. It might still work for the entry level. And maybe it does work in Brooklyn. We don't develop in Brooklyn. But, but for prime real estate in New York, you have to know your buyer. Buyer today are extremely selective. What's happening in the market today is that as more product comes up, people have options. And with optionality, you need to make sure you hit them exactly and you give them exactly both the amenities, the layouts, the views, all the things that the panel here said is accurate. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be focused around a specific buyer. Right, the, the amenities that we're doing at, at the Getty on 24th Street is not the same amenities that we're doing at 125 Greenwich or at the Crown Building or in Soho because the buyers are totally different. Mm -hmm. right, and, that's, and that hasn't changed today, hasn't changed you know, 10, 20 years ago. It's always, there's a buyer with a certain set of requirements. Yeah, I just can't imagine how different the amenities could be from one building to another. I mean, there's uh, only so much you can do. No, but, but that's not, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's actually inaccurate. That, that's inaccurate because Again, I'll give you an example. At, at, at 125 Greenwich, which is a building that's in essence full of, of, of pierre de terre type apartments, right? The 80% of the building is below three and a half million dollars. It's a lot of small apartments. But as we're giving people small spaces, 400, 500, 800 square feet, smaller apartments, we made the decision to build our amenities on the 88th floor. Mm -hmm. So every, instead of building expensive penthouses on top of the building, we elected to put you know, to give everybody, kind of everybody can live at the top, mm -hmm. right? Which, with the whole set of amenities, which I'm not going to tell you because then you're going to want to write about it. Uh, um, and, and we haven't given you that yet. But, but there's a whole set of amenities that's geared towards the specific lifestyle of somebody that might not be a full-time resident. Mm -hmm. At the Getty, you know, it's a totally different building. We have six private residences that are designed by Peter Marino that are, each one of them is unique. And it's all about the services. Mm -hmm. It's all about in the middle of the night, anything you need will be taken care of. So you have to understand, and, and Billy just said this, you know, absolutely correct. Abundance of amenities is, might work if you're building a building on 11th Avenue and you're in a zone where nobody can get to. But you have to do the right thing for the right place for the right person at the right time. You know, it's interesting you bring up studios and one bedrooms because over and over when we talk to the brokers who are actually out there selling this stuff, they ask for studios and one bedrooms. And they, you know, and yet it, I guess it doesn't make sense to build studios and one bedrooms. Why? But well, you're doing it at 125 Greenwich. We're building 275 of them. Why right, but, does it not make But sense? for the most part, most developments, uh, you know, they're not really considering the one bedrooms and studios. But Again, it's, it's the right place. It's what, it's what the specific product and specific buyer wants. I well, mean, we, it's we not, could say that what, about what, anything. So yeah, right, but it does, it, what works at 125 Greenwich doesn't work out on 12th Street. It's, it's, going, work. It's, it's going back to the like, 80s when Bruce and I were developing, my father was developing studios of one bedrooms. You know, that's all we built because the price you could get for them was higher than for larger apartments. So people will buy studios and ones. As long as, as long as we're, building, we're building one bedrooms, and we're probably building different one bedrooms than Michael's building downtown because our one bedrooms are are are, are larger. We <laughs> did well, no, but we did. <laughs> not going to comment on the 400 feet. How you pulled that off? But the, it, it's it's we. So the studios. <laughs> we we really sort of studied what the composition of buyer is in the Greenwich Village neighborhood, and it's really, it's an internal buyer. We're not, as you pointed out before, we're not selling to foreigners. I mean, of course we sell to foreigners. I mean, most of our traffic is from within. And we look at that market as, you know, parents buying apartments for kids, graduating college, empty nesters, retirees, and we have a selection of really great bath and a half one bedrooms that fill a certain void in the market. So we're not building the smaller one bedrooms, but we're building product that we think will, will readily and easily be absorbed. Just one, one comment about amenities, because the only place that um, it, it kind of gets intellectually interesting in, when you're doing a development is when you have to make a choice. Um, so, for example, um, one Madison put a pool in their basement, but they have no parking. So, now, you could put a pool somewhere other than the basement, 
and then you have a lot of water up there, which is probably a not good thing from a development perspective. So I kind of went like this and I said, you know, pools are nice, but I couldn't imagine having a luxury condominium in the middle of the city with no parking. So it, there, there was a, an intellectual choice to put parking in lieu of something else. I mean, other than that, I totally agree with the rest of the panel, which is you try to kind of craft your deck of amenities for whatever the population you perceive your building to be um, appealing to. But right, isn't, that, isn't that the reason that you put parking? Because you think that you, you, you assume that your buyer would prefer to have parking than have a pool. That is correct. Okay, it's an correct. amenity, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm going to ask one more uh, question from the panel, and then I'll go to the audience. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to go down the line. And Arthur, I want you to help these guys. They're getting a lot of buyers, and their buyers are, some, in some cases, reluctant because they're waiting for the market to adjust. I want you to sell 520 Park Avenue to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come down the line and have you guys each sell your project to them and tell them how to respond to certain answers as to the market slowing and the transition and all that stuff. So Arthur, I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, as with 15 Central Park West, which is a gold standard apartment house in the world, 520 is going to be the Upper East Side version. It's located between Park and Fifth which has always been the most premier address. The most billionaires live in the Upper East Side between Park and Fifth. The beauty of it, it is one apartment per floor, which is the amenity people want, because it creates exclusivity. You have 225 feet of windows on three sides, so you have no views blocked. We just now got to the 20th floor so we're clearly north, and the views north are spectacular on the Upper East Side Historic District, which is the oldest historic district created in 1966, and Landmark District. The building we did with Ramza Stern, who we did 15 with, and we worked very well with Stern in creating his best apartments. It is limestone, with windows, all apartments have 11 foot ceilings. We have three lifts, which is unusual for that size for 33 apartments. One's a double height lift, and there's 30,000 square feet of amenities. So there's a lot of amenity space. The penthouse is probably the finest apartment built, and we're very proud of it. The sales office is open. Sales have picked up in the last quarter. And we're very pleased. You should be ready in 2018. And we welcome you all to bring your customers there. Uh, I should have put a time limit on it. So <laughs> let, I still have more to let go. Me, <laughs> let me, uh, Michael, go ahead. <laughs> OK. OK. I've done this for so many years. So, 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 so it's my turn to sell 520 Park? <laughs> no. OK. Oh. Right. Oh. That would be the better exercise, exactly. So 21 East 12th Street, we're, we're, we're really excited to have the opportunity to leave a lasting imprint on Greenwich Village. And, and Greenwich Village really has been and continues to remain one of the most supply-constrained residential submarkets in the city. And into that market where there has been an absolute paucity of kind of clean sheet ground up development, we are bringing to market a building that has been designed interior and exterior by Annabelle Seldorf and and the curation of her work is creating a product that that sells to New Yorkers to families we have a variety of unit sizes we have height we have greenery we have environmental efficiencies and most of all we have a building presenting itself as a modern translation of those classic and traditional pre-war buildings and powerful structures that have lined the Gold Coast of Fifth Avenue in Greenwich Village for a hundred years. And out of that, what we're really delivering and developing is, is simply a place to call home. And that's hopefully within your prescribed time limit. That was uh, beautifully dramatic. I like that. That was nice. Uh, Michael, go ahead. We skipped you. Go. Our sales office opens June 1. There you go. Where, where is it located? 200 Park Avenue the South. The website? 9421East12.com. Okay. Thank you, Michael. 
prices start. Okay, out. okay, guys. Michael, we will call broke. Yeah. Michael, go ahead. Can I moderate? No. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. I don't have such a short, such a long attention span as as these wise gentlemen. I'm going to give you guys which project do you want me to sell? All of them together? 125 Greenwich. Okay. Let's do something else then. Um, <laughs> Okay, we can start. I'll, I'll give you guys. I'll give you guys four, four and sixty seconds. How's that? One twenty-five Greenwich uh, um, is the only residential building on the um, on the Memorial Park downtown. Eighty-eight story building, Raphael Vignoli design. It's a four thirty-two park downtown, but you can actually buy apartments between a million and a half to six million dollars. Your amenities on, are on the eighty-eight floor, and that's basically it. You're all going to have to wait until September to see this project. We're opening our sales office on the 84th floor of One World Trade Center. The only thing I can tell you is that we will have something extremely unpredictable as far as customizing your home. Just have to wait till September on that one. We just opened the sales office for 565 Broom, which we're doing um, in Soho. Sales office is about to open in um, for the Renzo Piano project in, um, in Soho. It's a 30-story, two-tower building. 100 units, um, private driveway, the only building in Soho that actually has views and services. What else are we doing? The Getty by Peter Marino. We can't talk about that. We have six apartments, 118 people on a wait list to get information. We can't That's talk it. about it. Thanks yeah. for bringing it up. Can't talk about Great. it. Great. <laughs> and you know, in the Crown Building on 57 and 5th, we're going to leave that to, to, to next year. Bruce? So. I go at this a little bit differently. So it starts kind of with the concept that I said people start by buying a neighborhood, then they buy views, then they buy finishes, then they buy amenities. So if I take the list and I go down the list, um, and lastly, it's a lot easier to sell something when people can see it. The one thing that 45 East 22nd Street is, it's visible. I get people sending me photographs from Williamsburg, from downtown Jersey, and it's a very eccentric building in that it's 75 feet wide at the bottom and 105 feet wide at the top. And I'll meet any one of the brokers that has a prospective buyer and we'll see if we can close the deal. I'd like to thank our panelists. Wait, hold on, I have, I have a side. Oh, wow, Jesus. <laughs> so this, I have something special for Amir. So the last time I was on your panel was in 2006. You remember that? Yeah. This was in, in Co Cooper Hewitt. So by, by, by chance, by chance, I actually pulled up the uh, transcript of what you guys asked and what the answers are. Okay. And I, I, I elected to read to you one question and one answer. Sure. Amir's getting very nervous. <laughs> he, was not he was not prepared for this. You ready? 2006, guys. So you were not the moderator. It was Steve Cuso. Steve from um, the New York Post. 2006, what is your global take on the alleged slowing of the condo market? Relevant 10 years ago. And this is my answer. I'm going to you're going to bear with me. I said, first thing, there's a slowdown, but it's not across the board. I think we're seeing a market change from a market where everything you put on the market went up and it sold. It didn't matter whether it's good or bad, it just sold. <laughs> a lot of brokers here will tell you the same. There was no correlation between price and quality. Okay. <laughs> With the amount of product coming to the market, the consumers are becoming smarter. There are going to be projects that are not going to sell. They're going to have to lower their prices. But there are going to be projects that sell and sell well if they're unique and different. And then I go on talking to David Wine yep. about Time Warner. That's Guys, that. 10 years ago, what this tells you is that, and I've said the same thing for the past 15 years, and this, you asked about, about buyers. If your buyers are looking to buy property in Manhattan, okay, in my personal opinion, I've been doing this for, for quite long, on this, a little bit on this side, a lot on that side, you always have to find a unique selling proposition. What, who is the buyer and what does the buyer want? There's a tremendous amount of brokers in the audience and I think that everybody here will agree that 
a good broker is somebody that can actually understand what the buyer wants and see what the developer is offering and what's unique in any one of the projects that any of us is developing and making that marriage. You don't have to show them 40 properties. Show them three and have them pick between the three that, that all work for them and then figure out what's left for them. But, so that's 2006. Nothing changed, man. We'll see you in 10 years. <laughs> I'm going to be retired again. Yeah. Nostradamus, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, guys.